Hello, everybody. My name is Bill Nissen. Uh, I guess you'd call me the director of Two Cubed. I'm a, a pastor in Cedar Rapids, and and really trying to share a very simple principle that um, I, I truly believe can change our culture. And I've, we've had shorter videos on this page that uh, explain the heart of it. So a lot of you probably already have the gist, but I'm I'm going to expand on a little bit here so you get a little more detail on where I'm coming from within the scriptures to really drive this point home. So the first thing I want to touch on is have us go to Luke chapter 10. You know, and this is where Jesus was, he was looking at the world. He was looking at uh, the, the harvest field. He was looking at every soul on the earth that needed to be touched by the Spirit of God to be changed and live in the kingdom of God. And he saw that this was a time when it was white for harvest. It was ready. We can do this thing. And he says here in, in verse 2, he, and he was saying to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go, behold, I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. So, he sees, you know, the, the need. He sees it. And what he does is he sends them out as laborers. I send you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. I'm not sending you out for you to take them over. I'm not, I'm not sending you out for you to be an aggressor. You are to be lambs in the midst of people that want to do, do harm, in, you know, in a world that's in a, in, a, in a rough place. And so we're supposed to come there with the grace, gentleness, the mercy, and the compassion of the Lord. Now, what he goes into now, uh, the next section here, I think is absolutely fascinating. Because in verse 4, he talks about, he says this phrase, carry no money belt with you, no bag, no shoes. What he's saying is, don't bring any of your own provisions. Don't bring any of your own tools. And so much of... I guess one application of this I, I approach with is so much of what we do is to prep people so that they can be experts in this thing. I So many people will tell me they don't want to do evangelism because they don't know apologetics. They don't know how to explain the age of the dinosaur or, you know, the young earth or, you know, evolution or, you know, uh, carbon dating, all that kind of stuff. It's like we've got to have illustrations to answer any objection people have to have. None of, you don't need any of that stuff in your money belt. You don't need any of that stuff in your bag. You just need yourself, your own story. You know, one of the things I love is in, in John chapter 9, when, the, when Jesus healed the blind man, you know, the Pharisees are just having a fit because he healed on the Sabbath. And, and he goes to this guy and goes, do you not know that this man is just a sinner? And, and the blind man, well, he's no longer blind anymore, but his response was just gorgeous. His response was beautiful. And it's the response we should have in those things. We don't need to win anybody over. We just need to be witnesses. And his response was, I don't know if he's a sinner or not. All I know is that I was blind and now I see. They can't argue with that. That's his story. That's what happened. He can't argue with that. So this is a power, powerful thing is to really be able to share with people our story. Nothing else. Just what we've experienced. And greet no one on the way. And, and one application I view that with is don't be distracted on this very simple task that God puts you on. There's a lot of things we could do on the way to the village that would be godly, that would be pious, that would be virtuous. But it's not what he told us to do. You know, there's sometimes, uh, you know, things we can do because we're afraid to do certain things in our lives because of our own stuff, we find things that we will substitute what we really should be doing with what we're doing here that seems godly. For instance, you know, I'm not saying you shouldn't, you know, dig into those scriptures about eschatology or end time stuff. If you want to knock yourself out. But I do think sometimes 
that people dig into that or get, dig into more analysis because it's something they can handle or control more so than intimacy with God or responding to the Spirit of God and what He wants you to do. And so I think, you know, to, to not be distracted on the simplicity of the purpose here. There's some very simple things that we can do. Now, let's just look at it. With all the complications we brought to what it means to, to express Christianity in this, in this country, are we really changing culture? Is it really working? Well, I'm about to show you here, I truly believe will work if we simply can overcome ourselves and do the very simple tasks that I'm about to show you. So we go to verse 5 and verse 6 of Luke 10. It says, Whatever house you enter, first say, Peace to this house. Peace be to this house. And if a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. What is that saying? A man of peace is simply somebody who's willing to listen to you. It takes interest in you. Wants to know what you are about. Wants to know your story. Wants to know what you have to share. If you have somebody looking like this guy in this picture, his eyes rolled up and his hands over there, you don't have a man of peace. You don't have somebody who really wants to hear what you're talking about. And you know what? That's okay. Just move on. We'll, we'll touch on that here in a minute. But just don't let that, you know, we're not here to debate him and win him over and convince him that he's wrong. You know, if that happens, wonderful. But that's not, we're here to bear witness to the truth. We're not here to win a debate. We're here to bear witness to the truth with our story. It's your story. Whatever your story is. You know, if your story is, yeah, I got saved when I was four. And so I haven't learned what it is to walk in sin and do all that stuff. I really, I've just loved God since then, and it's been a wonderful life. That's a great story. Share it. So the man of peace is somebody that is going to take interest in you. You have somebody that looks like this, where they're avoiding you. They're not a man of peace. They'll return to you. So that goes to verse 7. Stay in that house, if, if the man of peace receives you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking, and whatever they give you, what, what they give you, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not keep moving from house to house. Now, this, to me, is huge. One of the things I think we've seen through the years, at least modeled, is, you know, the evangelist goes out and he brings people in, you know, saves them. And then brings them in for the pastors and the people in church to clean the fish, so to speak, and take care of them and disciple them. I, I, I got to admit, that's what happened to me when I first came, got saved. There was a guy, I won't say his name because I don't want to uh, talk you know, negatively about him because he he's really serving the Lord. But he brought me in. I mean, he went to my house and witnessed to me all this. And I won't go into all those details, but I came forward and gave my life to Christ that weekend. And he... Uh, I never saw him again. Other people were supposed to clean the fish, and he went off to look for other souls. Uh, and it, I, I wasn't offended, but it did leave an empty spot in me because, you know, he pursued me, so I thought he wanted to know me, but he didn't. And and it's all about relationship. And the reality is, if if somebody's letting you in their house, and they receive what you give them, they're probably going to want to know you more and want to get more from you because the res the relationship has been established and their trust is with you. So you may see yourself as an evangelist, but if their trust is in you, you're the one that's going to be discipling them. You're the one that's going to be mentoring them. Don't go to another house. See, the key point here isn't that this one person just does all this work, goes from house to house to house to house to house and gets them all saved. It's for us to equip. You know, and it says about the evangelist in Ephesians chapter 4 that his role in the office of evangelist is to equip the saints. He gave the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists for the equipping of the saints. So the evangelist was to equip the saints so that we all, if we all found one person and stayed in that house and ministered to them and gave them what we had, we would turn this world upside down. I'm 
absolutely convinced of it. Now, I'll give you a story here, and and I'm going to say it vaguely because I, I heard it several years ago, and I, I I'm, not, I'm not saying this to be accurate or make any claims. I'm saying this just to share the beauty of the story because it's a true story. There was a gentleman that was asked to plant churches in India, northern India, the, the hard areas of India, not not southern India, which is, you know, very receptive to the gospel, but the difficult area, and some of the pastors that he had set in place got assassinated and it was just an awful thing and the lord brought him back to still plant churches but he gave him the the mandate of luke 10 and second timothy 2 2 really the whole focus of this of this page and so he was doing business in different villages i, I think he was selling ice you know for ice boxes or something like that but eventually he met a family that was intrigued by him that was a man of peace and he led them to the Lord. They came to know Christ. They embraced the whole message of the kingdom. Family was all converted and just transformed. Beautiful thing. And he stayed in that house. He just spent time with that family and nobody else. And I'll go into the second half of that a little later on, but that grew into a massive movement. And I don't want to get ahead of myself. But that's the power of staying with somebody and build a relationship where you know they're established and they have the goods to start with. Okay. And if you don't have a man of peace, just wipe the dust off your feet and move on. If the person rolls his eyes and puts his hands over his ears like we saw, then just move on. Don't try to talk him into it. Like I said, you're just a witness. You don't have to be a debater. And so then if you, you go into that house and you see that, you stay in that house, you give them what you have. Now, the second half of the story with that gentleman was he went to this man and his family and said, are you really enjoying the time we've been spending together about the kingdom? He says, it's life to me. It's transformed me. So I'm willing to do this from now on. No end in sight. As long as... As whatever you get from Jesus in our interactions, you give it in equal measure to someone else. And if there's a time when you stop doing it for somebody else, then we're going to stop. And if, Or if you taper off, you just don't do as much, then we're going to stop. The key thing here is to pass on everything that we get, everything that's alive to us. And eventually this gentleman, you know, so he spent all Monday with his family. And then eventually he found somebody in another village and he spent another day during the week with them and another day during the week with another family. And in a in a, several years, I mean, thousands of congregations, millions of people came to know Christ by each person finding one person to care about. It really is that simple. Uh, an illustration I gave in a meeting, and I, I shared this on another video, but it's, it's so good. I just got to share it again. I was doing a meeting in St. Louis. There's about 800 people in the room. And I asked him this question. How many of you came to know Christ? You know, a born again experience, personal relationship with Jesus. Through going to a crusade and going forward at the altar, signing the card, and having the prayer team pray for you. How many of you encountered Christ in that methodology? And out of 800 people, I think there was like 22, maybe 23 people in the room that raised their hand. And I said, praise God. It worked. It got you in the kingdom. That's wonderful. Now, my second question was, how many of you came to know Christ as your personal Savior through a stranger coming to your door and sharing the gospel? I, I think we had two that raised their hand. And those are the two main methods of evangelism that we teach in the church. And it works. I mean, people came to the kingdom. That was wonderful. Uh, that makes 25 out of 800 did. So I asked the rest of them, everybody else, raise your hand if you came to know Christ, you know, personal Savior, through a friend or a family member. And it became a room full of trees. Just arms went up everywhere. And it's because of what we're talking about here. It's they built a relationship with one person. They had a friend that cared enough 
and walked with them through this whole process. If we all find one person that we can pass it on to and then just give them the entrustment of passing it on to somebody else, it will not have to take long to see our culture change. Not long at all. I mean, it, it could be a holy virus that just takes over in a matter of weeks. Because 2 Timothy 2, 2, 2 says this. That's where we get the 2 cubed. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So here again, the things which you've heard. Oh, so, so it's like with this gentleman in India. The things that you received from me and have now received from other believers I've introduced you to. So we, we know it's good, good uh, theology. Let's find somebody that you can entrust it to, who's, who you know will be faithful to pass it on as well. And if we use that as our standard, so that whatever we're passing on, we're passing on in equal measure. We're not tapering off. We're not just giving them a few nuggets of it. We're not, not a few tokens. But I am spending as much time with you as has been given to me. And if not, we stop it. This, I am convinced, will transform our culture. You know, we could be down or we could be perplexed because of the politics going on today or because of the economy and what are we going to do? If we just spend a little bit of our energy doing this, I, I, I truly believe we can see a complete reversal of so many curses that are on our land right now. Because this is the kingdom of God. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would bring this basic truth to life, to everybody that hears what I'm talking about and can agree with it. And if there's people that disagree, just for us to be able to bless one another, but for us to see your church take off, not just maintain, but come on an offensive of extravagant love and care. Amen. So thanks for listening. And we'll have more videos and things for you to watch and, and drink in for us to really, and, and, and don't hesitate to contact me and, and just dialogue about this because this is something I'm very passionate about and just want, to, want us to see it go forth and see what the Lord wants to do. Amen.